Let me ask you a question. What is truth? Where can you find it? You know, I was in college in the early 70s. I majored in journalism and Bible. Both subjects needed to be based on truth. These days, though, both, <laughs> both of those are being questioned. You know, I was taught that as, that as a journalist, we were to be unbiased, tell both sides of any story. We had to get at least two references for and against anything that was controversial. Well, anything, basically, that was a story. And I am sure if my journalism professor was alive today, and he may still be, I don't know, he would be cringing right now at the all of the unjournalistic news stories that are being published. I would just like to send a note to every reporter who only tells one point of view and say, hey, don't look now, but your biased underpants are showing. <laughs> this would have been a major reason to get an F in my journalism class. Two quotes from each side sometimes wasn't even enough for for people to make a educated decision, but it sure helped more than just quoting whatever anyone wanted to say about any issue. Now, I love words, okay? So I went to my friend Miriam Webster to find out what truth really means. So here's some things that says truth is. The body of real things, events and facts, actuality, the state of being the case, fact, a judgment, proposition, or idea that is true or accepted as true, like the truth of thermodynamics, which might not even be the truth. We don't know for sure, right? Sincerity in action, character, and utterance is also truth. A transcendent, fundamental, or spiritual reality is listed as truth, and God the supreme ruler of, of ultimate reality is truth. Now, the problem we have today is that those first four definitions can be skewed as to what we think. Notice what we think is not on the list of what truth is, but I, I propose, <laughs> get my mouth around the right word, I propose that only the last two answers are right. Truth is what God says is truth. Truth is what God says is a fundamental spiritual reality. Bringing that down even further to what we as Christians believe, Jesus is truth. He told Thomas in John 14, 6, this is the Amplified, I am the only way to God and the real truth and the real life no one comes to the Father but through me. Then he goes on to tell the disciples in John 14, 15 through 17, if you really love me, you will keep and obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, stand by to be with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive and take into its heart because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he, the Holy Spirit, remains with you continually and will be in you. Truth is still coming to us from Jesus through the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Christ. For the disciples, this was much more difficult to understand. See, they could see Jesus, they could touch Jesus, they could hear Jesus. But what about this nebulous thing called the Holy Spirit? So going down to John 14, 26 in the Amplified, Jesus says this, but the helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, stand by the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place, to represent me, and act on my behalf, he will teach you all things 
and he will help you remember everything I have told you. What Jesus was telling the disciples was that he and the Holy Spirit were acting in one accord. Jesus is truth because he is a member of the Godhead who came to us as a person like us. He is the one who knows us completely because he has experienced all that we are experiencing. He tells us he will strengthen us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we believe that because we know he was strengthened by that same spirit. So here's the big question I had to ask myself. If I believe that Jesus is the truth, why for years did I base my life on a lie? Yeah, that's a Selah moment. Pause and think about this. It's hard when we have to face the cold, hard facts of what we've done. I looked back over my life and I saw that my entire life up to about 2009 had been based on a foundational lie that foods made with processed sugar and flour were necessary for my survival. They were necessary to help me keep my emotions in check. They were necessary to ease any pain, anger, shame, or fear. They were necessary to help me maintain a calm and peaceful demeanor. Living in the midst of this lie is what kept me stuck in super morbidly morbid obesity for years. I had chosen to eat those kinds of foods as my coping mechanism to deal with life. I didn't want to see the truth. Truth was right there, but I didn't, I didn't want to see it. I didn't want to understand or accept the truth. I pushed it away because that might mean I'd have to give up those things I had come to love more than life itself. Pushing the lie away only made room for more lies to come alongside it, prop it up. And then the truth got so buried that I didn't know if I could ever find it. I thought if I stopped eating those kinds of foods, my world would crumble around me without being able to indulge in what had become my crutch. But once I began to believe my own lie, I had to tell myself other lies so I could keep up some vestige of being a put together Christian. Now I'm just giving you the cold, hard facts here. In doing this, I was ignoring some basic core truths about God. I had to find a way to be a put together Christian and not get angry or have wide mood swings like my mom, who for a while was very emotionally ill. I wanted to have a more calm demeanor like my dad. And I really didn't understand that his strength came from being with God, from prayer and reading the Bible. As a kid, I couldn't put that together, but that was what made him so calm and peaceful. So from my grandma, I learned a different way to cope. It was an easier way to cope. Just eat foods that contain sugar and flour and suddenly all my anger and sadness just would fade away. The problem with this though, is that it is a false protection against my negative emotions that I didn't want to face or didn't know how to face. I was constructing my own kingdom built on things of this world instead of the truths of God. That meant my kingdom, my kingdom that I had built was destined to fall. I felt God wouldn't let me fail, but when I chose to build my life on lies, such as I need these certain foods to survive, God can't rescue me because I've made my choice. I had to see this as a foundational lie before I could ever expect to get free of this stronghold. Now, God's kingdom is totally different from ours. He has secrets, truths, mysteries of the universe about himself that he wants to impart to us. But as long as we are believing our own lies, we can't accept them. 
The truth is, they're not so secret, but sometimes we treat them like they are because we don't want to see them, accept them, or believe them. Because that would mean change. And personally, I didn't want to change. <laughs> Especially, uh, I didn't want to change what I ate. I would have to admit that I had been wrong all this time. I had built my life on things that might have helped me in the moment, but are now very destructive. So breaking free of lies is possible, but it's not possible on our own. We first have to recognize we are living in a house of cards that can topple at any minute. This is hard when we've been carefully constructing our dream house built of pretty little lies. We put every block in place exactly as we want it, and we don't want anyone, not even God, messing with what we feel is working for us. The problem is, my friends, it isn't working. We have blinded ourselves to think if we continue doing things the same way, somehow everything in our lives will magically change. However, no change will happen as long as we have our foundational lies in place. So one day God whispered to me, how does the lie of needing foods made with sugar and starches relate to me? In other words, how do they relate to God? I knew the answer because God had revealed it to me years ago but I was running from it and not trusting him. I didn't want to give up sugar. If I did, I'd have to give up what I felt was the assurance of my version of sanity. Sanity, I can't even say that word. Sanity, there you go, and mental health. I was about to begin to go through the arduous task of uncovering not just the lies I believed, but how those had become specific strongholds God wanted broken and replaced with his truth. These strongholds were going to have to be broken before I could surrender completely to God. I had to learn how to fit all of my loose thoughts, emotions, and impulses into the structure of life shaped by Jesus, God's son. Instead of believing lies, I had to take my thoughts, feelings, and impulses captive to the obedience of Christ, like it says in 2 Corinthians 10.5. The lies we believe invade our lives stealthily. They are like the serpent, serpent in the garden. Now, here's my take on it. He wasn't crawling on the ground when he approached Eve. This didn't happen until later when God cursed him. Nope, I think he was eye level with her. We know he was crafty, he was subtle, he was skilled in lying. He was good at telling half-truths. He came to Eve looking fine and handsome to set up doubt in her mind. That's in Genesis 3.1. He did such a good job that he tricked her into eating what to me had to be a cinnamon crunch bagel hanging on that tree. It's whatever would have tempted each of us the most if we had been there, and that's one of my big temptations. It wasn't until later that the serpent was relegated to crawling on the ground, eating dust, and putting open hostility between him and the woman. That's in Genesis 3, 14 through 15. So this fine-looking former angel that appeared to Eve was unveiled as the snake he really was and still is. His lies were no longer pretty, but this didn't mean he would stop peddling them to anyone and all who would believe them. Even today, we listen to his lies because he tells us what we want to hear. Do you hear me, friends? He's telling you what you want to hear. He tells us if we do this, it will be the answer to all of our problems. Eve wanted more wisdom, 
She wanted the ability to be like God, to have more power. And the serpent offered this to her in Genesis 3, 4 through 6. Instead of being the answer to Eve's dreams, her disobedience to God was her ticket to death. Now, Adam and Eve didn't die right then. So on that part, the, the serpent was half right. It's a half truth. They didn't die right then, but they ushered in death for all humanity. Not only were they banned from the paradise that God had made for them, but they were cut off from the tree of life, which gave them access to eternal life and no death. One day, their human bodies would cease to exist. And Satan's half-truth was they surely wouldn't die. But he for conveniently, very conveniently, forgot to add the timing for that event. Giving in to the temptation of eating food forbidden by God set up an outcome not just for them, but for their children and for all of humanity. Half-truths are meant to deceive us and get us to do something which goes against what God wants for us. Sooner or later, those half-truths are going to be revealed as lies. And when they grow into strong, then they are going to grow into strongholds for many different reasons. So here are a few of those reasons. See if any of these resonate with you. They are a half-truth is easier to believe than the truth. The solutions they bring don't require any work on our part. They never do. We think they solve all of our, all of our problems. We convince ourselves that they are true or not that bad. Yeah, and we don't have to change to believe them. That's a big one because we don't like change. We can do, we can continue to do whatever we want. There's no uh, parameters on half truths. They sound really good at first. And life seems like it would be much simpler if we believed those. Our minds are focused on what we want rather than what God wants. And we want to believe the half truth. Now, no half truth is pretty. It's an out and out lie that will start a string of events that the devil has planned in order to destroy us, just like he did with Eve. This is why half truths and lies we believe have to be exposed. If not, they become footholds for the devil and then strongholds. Uh, Ephesians 4.27 says, do not give the devil a foothold. Why? Because it's going to become a stronghold. We do not want it to be stronghold of the enemy. Even though at first it looks inviting, eventually we will find this place of imprisonment is nearly impossible to leave. Now, we do hold the keys for our freedom. It all hinges on knowing, accepting, trusting, and experiencing the truth of who Jesus is. It's not just cognitively knowing that Jesus died for us. It's not just um, knowing that he rose from the dead, is seated in heaven today, and if we repent of our sins and believe in him, we will be saved. We must experience the truth of how he changes the entire trajectory of our lives. In John 8, 32, in the message, Jesus says, if you stick with this, living out what I tell you, you are my disciples for sure. Then you will experience for yourselves the truth, and the truth will free you. Notice he says, experience truth. How we experience truth. Experience, experiencing truth is when the truth moves from our heads to our hearts, and then to our hands and our feet as we live it out by following him in obedience every single day. If we want to live out the truth of Jesus, we can't keep doing what everyone else is doing without even thinking. 
when we do this, we lose touch with the way Jesus wants us to live our lives. We quickly deteriorate because we are living for the evil one. This leads us to wrap ourselves in false, false protections, which will eventually become addictions. But don't be disheartened. Jesus is more than ready to lead us back to the truth, no matter how scary it seems like it's going to be to get there. Facing the lies I believed and getting to the core issues, propping up those lies has been one of the most freeing things I have ever done. But it's not easy. If it were easy, we'd have all done it by now, right? So we are afraid of this breaking of strongholds because they are things that we have relied on for a long time. We may just not have defined them as strongholds because there will be emotions attached to discarding these lies that the strongholds are built on. This was difficult for me because I didn't trust myself to feel any emotions. Crying was weak, shouting was crazy. I just wanted to be what I perceived as normal. You know, the creator though, made us with emotions. And Jesus demonstrated this for us while he was on earth. He cried. John 11, 33 through 36. He enjoyed time with his friends. John 2, 1 through 10. He got angry. John 2, 14 through 17. He loved others. 1 John 3, 16. Without emotions, life would be very boring. But without properly managing our emotions, life can be really scary. So instead of learning how to manage our emotions, we continue trying to live to placate those feelings until the pain of living that way becomes greater than our fear of change. We must be willing to do anything to change what we have been relying on other than God. We must commit to our own transformation. This will be the starting point for you to break strongholds. It's the first step to allow God to lead you completely. Now we have to get to the point that we fully embrace what we believe is not necessarily God's truth. What the serpent whispers to us while disguised as an angel is definitely not the truth. Truth only comes from living out what Jesus tells us. He is truth, not what we believe or what the devil whispers to us, only what God tells us. Now, I had to accept completely what it says in John 14, 6. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through him. He promises if we believe in him, we can do the same thing he did. But we can do those things to an even greater extent and outreach than he did while he was here on earth. John 14, 12 tells us that. So we can see this is true with the advent of radio, television, the internet. These possibilities are bigger than they've ever been before. Jesus didn't just share the truth. He is the truth. If we believe who he says he is, then we will hear his voice, know his voice, and follow him in all things like John 10, 27 says. If we have any doubts that what we are believing or living out is the truth, we need only ask him. And friends, he will tell us if we want to know. But we have to listen. You know, he was more than willing to teach me his truths which would break the strongholds that I had allowed to be erected in my life. And friends, there are many of them. And I'm going to share these with you in the next few months, okay? He knew this would bring me closer to fulfilling the destiny he had planned for me. He would lead me. I just had to be willing to listen and follow. Before I pray for you, I want to remind you um, if you have any issues you don't know how to attack, and a lot of us do, 
the best place I can help you is in Overcomers Academy. Just go to TeresaShieldsParker.com backslash Overcomers. That link will be in the show notes. And I'll also have the link there for you to get my book, Sweet Surrender, on Amazon. So let's pray. Jesus, we want more than anything to believe you are who you say you are and to follow where and how you lead us. But we have to admit that there are days our selfish motives get in the way. Right now, show each person listening to this to be willing to trade the lies they are believing is helping or helping them for the truth of who you want to be in their lives. Help us to really live out the fact that you are the truth, that our lives reveal that. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, until next week, sweet grace for your journey.